I'm in London's famous Soho neighbourhood on a glorious sunny day talking to people about gayborhoods. I think attitudes have changed with more people being gay and coming out and the city is very free with being, you can be who you want to be here. Basically, I think that's down to people wanting to live in the area. They complain about what was Soho, which was nightlife and all the, all the life that was here. The bars, the nonsense that used to carry on and whatever else have you. And now, if anything happens, they complain. So why would people want to come to Soho? It's losing what it used to have. Say I'm a very young man. Well, I can tell you that actually this is the first time I found out that it was a gay neighbourhood. I thought it was like a sexy place. I knew it had a certain sense of debauchery to it, but I didn't know that was tied to anything LGBT. So I think the first time I went was probably around 2007, 2008 at a Pride event. I didn't really experience it properly though until I was 18, so around 2011. In our modern age, the gayborhood has provided solace and refuge to members of the LGBTQ plus community in search of community, family, romance, or a mixture of all three. And yet, as the tide turns towards inclusion where it didn't exist before, when the old establishments of the gayborhood close and developers move in, what becomes of places like West Hollywood, Chelsea, the Village in Montreal, or Paris's La Marais. Consider this. The Lesbian Bar Project notes that as of 2021, there are only 21 lesbian bars in all of the United States of America, with two in California. According to the gay travel guide, Dameron, there were 1,500 gay bars in the United States in 2019, down from 2,500 in 1976. What does this tell us about the health, vitality, and future of gayborhoods? Can businesses and entertainment venues stay alive as the cost of rent soars, interests shift, and people demand more of these spaces that have traditionally been offered to them? We'll explore all of that and more with my guest, Julie Podmore, Affiliate Assistant Professor, Geography, Planning, and Environment at Concordia University. Throughout this episode, we'll also hear from Andrew Bird of Avis & Young about the changing face of the gayborhood in Birmingham, England. I'm Miriam Sove, and this is Changing Places. Let's head to Birmingham, England to hear from Andrew Bird about their gayborhood. So around 2011, I think since then there's been good and bad changes. I feel like there's a lot more variety here now, not just at bars or hidden venues. Like when, where we're currently standing now at the top of Hurst Street, when you look down, you can see a few bars, outdoor spaces, a lot more socialisation. There's places like Loft Lounge, where you can sit and eat and you have a beer garden, a lot more outdoor spaces being utilised now. It's created such a good vibe and it's opened up Gay Town a lot more to diverse people. But then in terms of bad, there have been closures since then, which COVID didn't help. I've seen in the news this week that a club called Sheep is closing down, which I believe opened in 2004. There are also a lot of luxury apartment developments which have started to begin making people nervous for the future. In order to understand how we got here, I'm going to chat with Julie Podmore, who has given a lot of thought, time and research into the evolution of gayborhoods, specifically the village in Montreal. Julie Podmore, welcome to Changing Places. Oh, thank you for having me. Julie, if we take a step back and look at the origins and evolution of gayborhoods like the Castro in San Francisco or the village in Montreal, they often started as an immigrant or former immigrant neighborhood where rent was cheap, people could build their own community. And I wonder, this may be quite a vast question here, but how did the gayborhood wind up being at risk for its survival when it was created to serve those mainstream society, for lack of a better term, seemed to shun? The gayborhood has been through many stages. And I suppose initially those neighborhoods were chosen because they were marginal and people were able to create kind of safe havens for themselves in in neighborhoods like the Castro or in Montreal's gay village, which it's working class East End. But over time, of course, the gay villages diversified. They became much more integrated into the urban economy and were mainstreamed really in the 1990s. And so in a way, they're victims of their popularity. They're seen much more as places for non-LGBT entrepreneurs to invest in. And for these reasons, there's been a lot of economic and cultural change in them and a lot of displacement, I think, of the original gay bars and bathhouses and so on, the anchors really of those gay village landscapes. So it seems like uh, from the late 90s through the mid-2010s, gayborhoods really had a moment 
Pride Month was huge. People wanted to be in those neighborhoods for a variety of reasons. Um, internal civic engagement seemed really high in places like West Hollywood and Boys Town. To your knowledge, when did this change? When did we begin to see a decline in gayborhoods? I think we can go back to the late 1990s and think about what was going on in neighborhoods then. As you mentioned, they were becoming increasingly incorporated into, for example, municipal plans and becoming incorporated as part of business improvement districts. And so that really increased the uh, commercial scope of those environments. And a lot of the entrepreneurs began to uh, rework those spaces. And through that, they, they became uh, much more mainstreamed. Uh, especially with the introduction, for example, of chains and franchises and things that have very little to do with the actual gay village so that there aren't necessarily gay restaurants in the gay village anymore. And so that really contributed to the mainstreaming. I guess the advent of a number of political and social and communications changes are what most of the people in the literature believe changed the role of the gay village, the most important being the social media, right? So people don't need to necessarily go to physical spaces to meet each other and to build up a community that can be done much more now online and through social media apps. You can find supportive environments online and that's become much more important than actual physical space. And then, of course, the rise of equality, the non-discrimination clauses against LGBT people, the civic enfranchise of gay marriage. And here in Canada, that happened in 2005. And uh, all of those things transformed LGBT people into citizens and therefore having more greater number of civil rights. It meant that they were not necessarily as marginal anymore. At least some LGBT people were not as marginalized, those who could be. Of course, that leaves a whole host of other people who haven't been enfranchised but are part of the LGBT community and the nuances of social class and race and so on and so forth that mean that a number of groups remain excluded and feel disenfranchised, I guess you could say. Over the past five years, there's been a much more corporate influence in Soho with chains rather than in independence. And this is due to business rates from Westminster City Council and also excessive rents with landlords wanting to maximise their spaces. So there's fewer independents and a lot more chains around, which isn't quite good. And I also think that a gay neighbourhood, it's, it's always, always been a mixed neighbourhood. So, um... Do you think that the changes that you mentioned from society and governments, uh, you seeing a shift in their acceptance of the LGBTQ plus community? And could that be a reason why some neighborhoods are disappearing? Aside from technology, is it also just because it's becoming a part of the mainstream that people don't see a need for niche? I think so. Those people, the gay villages often accused now of being homonormative, right, which is like but it represents a very particular, mostly white gay man. And his sort of way of engaging in urban space, his sort of territoriality and and perhaps his affluence and the gentrification that's associated with the gay village. And yeah, that's a, one of the key points. But furthermore, another really key component of this is the way that cities are changing broadly in and of themselves. So there's a lot of displacement coming now from, for example, here in Montreal, the expansion of the entertainment district is leading to quite a lot of displacement and impacting the gay village itself. And of course, rising housing costs, rising commercial land costs, all of those things are underlying sort of the displacement of the gay village as well. Back when one of our major lesbian bars closed in 2016 in the village, I think that the rent for that bar was something like $20,000 a month. So you have to sell a lot of beers to be able to pay rent for $20,000 a month. So that was, that's one of the biggest challenges, I think, as well. And more and more people are moving out of the city. We have this kind of model of what we call the metronormativity model, that to be queer or to be LGBT, you need to move to the city. Um, that's the only place you can be gay. But of course, ultimately, our cities across North America and in, and in Europe are becoming much more expensive, the inner city areas. And it means that many people need to move out to fi find more affordable housing. And that means that there are more and more people living in more suburban environments or in neighborhoods that we might th think of as being inner city adjacent and slightly queer friendly. That's an another component of all of this, the queer friendly neighborhood emerging in other parts of the inner city where affordable housing can still be found. 
Stay tuned for the next part. And just a reminder, Changing Places is a podcast brought to you by Avis and Young that continues to explore and question our complex relationship with the built world around us. I'm your host, Miriam Sobe. I hope you're liking the show so far. If so, please share Changing Places with your friends. Welcome back to Changing Places. Before we get back to my conversation with Julie Podmore, let's go back to London to hear what people there think about changes to Soho. I don't like the idea of landlords, any governmental body like a city, doing something to ensure that there's an enclave of LGBT people or Chinese people. In Sorry, that's the next example. Or, or, or anything of the sort. I think that we're all spread out. Many Generation Z people are identifying as LGBT. I think it's like one in six or something. I don't think that we need to isolate these people anymore for protection. I think that we're a tolerant people and we should spread out that kind of love. I think the landlord should realise that if there were more gay bars opening and it being more like that, there's always a thing about the gay pink pound, so more people have got more money to spend. I think we're a community that's thriving. We have the pink pound. We've probably got a spare cash to spend and disposable income. I think it's definitely a community that businesses, landlords and councils and governments should pay more attention to purely because of the fact that we have more disposable income. Yeah. I think so it's more like the heart of London at times and if that's lost it'll be a real shame. It's not even being pushed out to the edges anymore because th- those little mini neighborhoods are also being lost. So, Julie, let's look ahead to the next 10 or 20 years to see what you think lies in store for neighborhoods. But first, let's head back to Birmingham to hear from Andrew Bird. We'll be back after this. So we're here on Kent Street now. It's halfway down Hurst Street. It's home to Nightingales and Sidewalk Bars on the corner. For me, this has always been the centre of gay town. Nightingales was the first gay club I've ever been to and probably my favourite. And I'd probably say the most popular club now, which has survived since I've started coming anyway. Luckily, I've been told the lease has been renewed since. And so I'm really glad that she's still standing. For me, this was the first club I could be myself and not to worry about homophobia. To witness all different types of people and all getting along and having fun without the worry. It's an important place for the community and I don't think gay town would be the same without it. Which, just further down the road on Lower Essex Street, a club called Deviate used to be located. I believe it opened in 1999, but sadly it closed down after the sale of the venue in 2011. From what I've been told, it was one of the best places to be. A lot of people were saddened by the news when it was closing down and still speak fondly of it now. Which reminds me to be grateful for Nightingales and other clubs that are still operating. Julie, what are you seeing in neighborhoods right now when it comes to things like services and entertainment options? Are those still uh, stuck in city centric neighborhoods or are you seeing a push to suburban and rural areas? My project on clearing suburbia with Alison Bain at York University, we found that there is really over the course of our study over the last five years, the emergence of, for example, suburban support centers for LGBT youth. And even here in the Vancouver region, gay prides that have developed in the suburban municipalities, I think what's happening is there's a combination of the displacement of LGBT adults and sometimes even seniors from the center of the city. And meanwhile, young queer people, LGBT identified in suburbs are coming out a lot earlier. There's a lot more support for that. And so they're coming out when they're living in suburbia with their families. 70% of all North Americans live in suburbs. So a lot of my work has been on the response of municipalities and how you know, not all suburban municipalities, but some will try to mark that inclusion by having things like by holding proclamations of Gay Pride Day or of the International Day against homophobia, transphobia and biphobia, as well as raising rainbow flags, for example, or even painting in painting rainbow crosswalks in their suburbs so that they can mark themselves as inclusive. I'm not saying that those don't go uncontested because, you know, very often rainbow crosswalks are vandalized in suburbs, but we're starting to see like an emerging sort of queer politics in suburbia that is quite visible and quite public and quite central to the politics of inclusion in those spaces. Yeah, I think, I think you look at Gen Z and the whole sort of gay, lesbian thing doesn't really exist for them. It's less relevant to them. But I think there's still a nice feeling to come somewhere which is quite sort of gay and, I don't know, local, I suppose. Kind of going back to the origins of neighborhoods. If folks can't afford to live in the Castro or Boys Town, they don't want to move back to the suburbs. 
What's the option for them? Are they moving to cheaper neighborhoods in order to form new neighborhoods aligned with their individual expression or interest, for example? One of the ways we can think of this is as as neighborhoods are losing their prominence as places to live in, they were, and also places where LGBT people consume specific forms of entertainment and community, for example. And we have to think that there are a number of different kinds of spatial formations emerging, I guess. One is the sort of querying of suburbia, the decline, and another is the decline of the village. And I think another element of this is the rise of what we might call the queer-friendly neighborhood. So you have more and more people who, let's say, because of increased uh, social rights and enfranchisement, are quite comfortable living in any neighborhood, not one that's necessarily designated as queer or, and maybe even take pleasure in living in a neighborhood that is a diverse, culturally diverse neighborhood where they feel a sense of acceptance and, and anonymity even. And this has typically been the way that lesbian neighborhoods have actually formed, but more and more now we're starting to see certain neighborhoods identified as maybe being queer friendly. They're friendly to diversity in a broad sense. Usually that's referring to ethnocultural diversity as well as LGBT populations. And those are usually other inner city neighborhoods and they are right on the frontiers usually of gentrification, right? So of course, a lot of LGBT inner city residents are very much both displaced by gentrification and really wrapped up in it, often at its frontiers in their search for a place for acceptance or a neighborhood where they feel comfortable, an area that's queer friendly. Yeah, I think the queer friendly neighborhood is one of one of the sort of rising phenomena. And each of them will have, for example, different social characteristics. For example, here in Montreal, I've done a study on the queer mile land, which is like Brooklyn. I'm, I don't know the equivalent in Los Angeles or San Francisco, but it's a hipster neighborhood. And it's also partly a queer neighborhood associated, of course, with artistic production in the creative city. And then, and that's where upper middle class young queers live. <laughs> but we can find other neighborhoods, for example, because Montreal's divided into English and French in the East End. It's like really politicized queer francophones living in a neighborhood called Hoche Lega Maisonneuve. And in the West End, a neighborhood called St. Henry is more sort of English and has different composition. So sorting out of the queer city into different and new pockets, I guess you could say. I think there's been a lot of development here. And probably that's also pushed out what was typically the gay community. And before that, it was more of a red light district. So it's always had a little bit of a hipster, edgy feel to it. I think in the last five years, it's become a little bit more normalised or bourgeois, shall we say? To be quite frank, part of the vibe's already gone. You know, I remember coming to Soho 10, 15 years ago. I never wanted to leave. It was amazing. Like now, this is the first time I think I've been in three months and I live in Greenwich. I've been here 10 years now. And I used to like enjoy coming down to Soho for a drink after work. And like now, I can't be asked. Yeah. Yeah, because there's nothing to really draw me here, you know. When we talk about folks being turned away from some of these communities and neighborhoods, are we seeing that, for example, people coming in wanting to have bachelorette parties? Are they being turned away or is inclusion more about services for people, let's say with children, people who may not adhere to a cisgendered identity? Inclusion is a really complicated word these days in urban planning and urban studies, because inclusion has this ability to stand alongside the words like diversity. And they can be easily corrupted into by into promotional strategies for promote certain kinds of neighborhoods. And they can be associated with a kind of performative or symbolic politics. Uh, that doesn't necessarily always mean providing uh, resources for a group, but rather just saying, OK, for example, here in Montreal, they decided that they want to change they get the name of the gay village. For Historically, it was called Le Village Gay in French. And many people feel that that's not inclusive enough, for example. I don't think a name change <laughs> is going to change, for example, the resources that are available in terms of the community spaces and the commercial venues and so on and so forth. Inclusion sometimes can be highly symbolic in that way rather than being substantive in terms of actually making a change where people will want to come back to the gay village or find it a viable place, a place full of resources for themselves, that would require a lot of work on the part of municipal governments, I think, to really recognize that gay villages were historically commercial spaces 
And without those commercial spaces, they won't exist. And so the only way to combat that really is to build more subsidized community spaces that will bring people back to that environment, whether it's community center right at the center of the gay village or other kinds of maybe more experimental community sites that might put the LGBT archive beside a youth center or something like that and create synergies between them. It could be all kinds of ways of transforming that space, but it takes a lot of government initiative, really, to support the cultural infrastructure necessary to preserve gay villages. When a gay neighborhood or even places like Chinatown will cease to exist, then it's just changing the city to something that it has always been. For I've lived in London for God, too many years, and it's always stayed the same. So if you change a neighborhood, it's no longer... Soho. And Soho has just got a, a reputation of being gay, Chinatown, and the place to come and visit in the evenings. I take issue with the word gayborhood, because Soho has always been an incredible, diverse, creative industries, shop workers, uh, all sorts, nightclub people. So it's always been a very mixed kind of space where gay people have felt safe and independent owners of bars and restaurants who want to open up a gay venue have no issue there. And there's always been a mixture with non-gay people as well. So, gayborhoods, I would say Soho's never been a gayborhood. And it does sound a bit North American to me, that term, anyway. With people moving out of gayborhoods, I think part of it is a natural shift we have as we get older. We want to move out of the city and have bigger places and more green spaces. An example of this in Birmingham is Kings Heath, uh, which is getting quite a popular area. I think a lot of it, though, is to do with the luxury living spaces that are becoming so more expensive, which is pricing pe many people out. I think coupling that with the venues closing down and the feeling that gay town like security and CCTV, people are getting not getting the benefit they used to have, so they move out and just come in and visit, so then leave. I think the evolution has to be around having more variety. As far as I'm aware, there's only one dedicated space for gay women, the Fox Bar. I think we need more restaurants, cafes, leisure facilities, for people to do things beyond drinking. I think if you have more affordable living, particularly having places for the older LGBTQ plus community, it will make the safe a lot of space and more inclusive for everyone. And I think that's the best way we can evolve. Julie, if we look ahead to the next decade or two, what do you think lies ahead for neighborhoods? not only the village in Montreal, but around the world? I would like to say that I think that they will be around because they serve such an important function for people who are migrating from different countries, for example, or a young person coming to the big city from a rural area, hoping to find people like themselves. It's really important to have this physical kind of space that people can go to and identify with. But I think it's a probably uh, go through a complete decline because really what I see there is the commercial venues. They're no longer very specific. I personally don't need to go to the neighborhood and there's nothing offered to me there or to, to many other people there that you can't find in another neighborhood. The only thing would be the bars, for example, but those are declining in numbers all, all over as well. I think really the only solution is a cultural one and support for maybe cultural organizations and ensuring that they continue to be located in those environments to pull people back. But I don't think that we can depend on the commercial infrastructure of gay villages to create a future for the gay village, basically, because they're just business and enterprises for the most part. And also, I can speak from the Montreal perspective, but I'm sure that's just going on in many other places. Of course, there's all kinds of gay villages have made uh, parts of the inner city attractive spaces for investors. And uh, that has ultimately meant that there have been, uh, there are now uh, large redevelopment programs and projects that are associated um, with that space. And uh, ultimately, that really changes the dynamic in those spaces. It's difficult to find a way to build the vitality of those spaces when there's a dramatic change in the, the residents brought by urban redevelopment programs. Julie, thank you for joining us on Changing Places. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And finally, Andrew Bird. The changes within wider society are making gay towns less relevant to feel, or like staple to people now. We're seeing LGBTQ people and our culture being made more mainstream, like drag brunches and raves and, and different events, which are a lot more inclusive. I feel like people are a lot more likely to go to these venues and events because they're a lot more comfortable for everybody, at least not being afraid to be LGBTQ, which then makes a gay town less relevant. 
We've got places like Albert Sloss, which is one of my favourite places to go to, which isn't within Gay Town, but it is bringing us into the mainstream and it makes us feel safe. I think the future of Gay Village is more inclusivity. We should be focused on catering for all aspects of the community, not just gay clubs and bars, spaces for all members of our community. We need special housing, social housing for older LGBTQ people. We need more affordable living spaces. We need more safe spaces for women and non-binary people. We need community centres or careers advisors to help everybody at all ages and aspects of their life. I think if we can keep, create a safe space and a sense of belonging for everyone, we can secure the future of gay neighbourhoods. I'd like to thank Julie Podmore and Andrew Bird for taking the time to talk to us about the world of neighbourhoods. I think one thing that stuck out to me is how changes in moods, attitudes, ideals, goals, and even federal policy can begin to change spaces in a very quiet, subtle way. For many, the neighborhood seemed like a fixed, settled idea. Some had their own representative in government, others became entertainment beacons for people around the world, and yet the winds of change happen. People move, businesses close. A new generation of people demand more of a neighborhood than it can or is willing to provide. And perhaps that's not a bad thing. If more services and choices overall are located in other parts of the city, in the suburbs and in rural areas, then in theory, everyone wins. But a neighborhood, like most neighborhoods, must continue to change, evolve, and demand to stay relevant into the next fiscal year, the next decade, and far beyond. For every West Hollywood, there's Seattle's first long forgotten neighborhood, Pioneer Square. Yes, things come and go, but a community in whatever form it takes must continue to fight for its very existence. I'm Miriam Sobe. This is Changing Places. Changing Places is brought to you by Avison Young. Our producer is Andrew Pemberton Fowler. Our sound engineer is Patrick Emil. Our producer assistant is Hugh Perkich. Additional production support is provided by Jar Audio. 